Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Suleiman. Um, I'm computer vision uh, lead engineer uh, working at Blink Technologies. And today I'm very excited to share with you a bit about uh, eye tracking theory and applications. Do you hear me well? Yeah, okay. So uh, we'll start by having a quick introduction and background and then we'll see uh, two different approaches that tries to solve this problem. Uh, the first one will be a geometrical eye modeling, uh, while the second one is uh, data-driven methods that use uh, deep learning techniques. Uh, I believe that we need to understand the geometry behind the problem before we start uh, developing machine learning and deep learning techniques. Uh, that's why I want to show you both uh, solutions. And we'll see also what the market has to offer in terms of devices and what are the limitations. And we'll, we'll have a short overview about Blink Technologies, just so you will know a bit about uh, the company. So what is eye tracking? Um, so as you can see in the video, we want to track the eye movements and want to do so by capturing the eye using an image sensors. So today we'll focus on RGB sensors, although it can be also done using an active IR. Um, the main focus will be to predict the gaze point or the gaze vector. So the gaze point is the point in the space that you are looking at, that you are fixating at. And uh, the gaze vector is a vector connecting between your eye location and uh, the gaze point. Uh, this is a very old uh, research uh, topic, uh, mainly focused on psychologies and medicine, uh, medical studies. But today we want to see what we can do with the, this technology in modern applications. So uh, as you can see, uh, there's a lot of potential for this technology to be integrated uh, in different applications. So we can do user-based, uh, user, uh, user authentication based on eye movements. Uh, you can use eye tracking technology to control different devices like uh, smartphone, laptops, uh, smart panels, uh, and more. You can use an automotive to monitor uh, the passengers and of course, the immediate usage will be in uh, mixed reality, where we want to use our eyes to interact with the environment. So instead of having these weird uh, joysticks, we want you to be able to use your eyes uh, to, inter to interact more uh, intuitively with the environment. So before we dive into the problem, let's see a bit about uh, the eye anatomy. So if you take a look at the eye uh, image, we see uh, the sclera. This is the white region of uh, the eye. And then we see the iris, uh, which is, uh, has circular shape. It's basically a muscle uh, controlling the amount of light uh, go to your eyes through the pupil. And if we take a look at the schematic view, we can also see the cornea. This is uh, the outer uh, layer of the eye. Uh, protecting the lens, and inside the eye we see the fovea, which is uh, the area where you have the largest number of uh, sensors to capture the light. So as we said, we want to predict uh, where the user is looking at, and as we know, uh, our eyes has a very large field of view. So you see uh, uh, different uh, things in, in the image, but we want to predict this small area where you, where you are fixating, okay? So we want to do so in accuracy of one, one degree uh, accuracy, at least. So it's very, very challenging, uh, and not easy task to do, um, and we'll see how we uh, try to uh, solve these problems. So we'll start by reviewing the geometrical uh, eye modeling or uh, the model-based methods. So uh, in the model-based methods, to predict the point of regard, we start by reconstructing a 3D model of the eye. That means that you want to find the intrinsic parameters uh, that defines the eye model. And to do so, we have a calibration process where we ask the user um, to look at specific points in the screen, and we take an images of his eye. Using this data, we can reconstruct 3D model of the user's eye, okay? So now that you have the model initialized for a specific user, we are ready now to do prediction. So given new image, uh, we can find 
interesting features in the image. It can be the iris contour, the pupil location, and we want to unproject these features onto the 3D model, as we see here. So now we have also the pupil in the 3D space. Um, and now we can define the first vector, which is the optical axis. So it's uh, a line connecting between the eyeball center and the pupil center. Note that uh, this vector is not guaranteed to be aligned with the fovea location. And if we want to be able to predict uh, uh, and accurately the foveal area, we want to be aligned with the fovea location. That's why we apply a kappa correction to this optical axis. And now we have the visual axis, which is aligned uh, with the fovea location. Note that these uh, alpha beta uh, angles is also person unique. So we need to find these parameters du during the calibration process as well. OK, so now that we have a uh, visual axis from each eye, we can uh, take into account uh, the head pose and different coordinate systems. And by applying simple triangulation methods, we can calculate the point of regard. OK? So uh, the big question in model-based method is how you geometrically model the eye. You need to uh, suggest some modeling of the eye shape. So uh, there are several models uh, uh, appeared in the papers. One of them is the two spherical model. So we have uh, two spheres, one sphere representing the eyeball, um, another sphere representing the cornea. And we see uh, the imaged pupil. It's not the two pupil. Uh, the two pupil located inside the eye, lying on top of uh, the iris plane. What we see outside is a refraction uh, of this pupil due to the cornea surface. And uh, as we said, so we can start by uh, uh, defining the optical axis. And then uh, after applying kappa correction, you have uh, the visual axis, the one that aligned with the fovea location. So um, all these intrinsic parameters of the eye, you need to find them during the calibration process uh, uh, per person. Uh, and to do so, uh, we use uh, basically geometric, geometric methods. Um, so given these uh, knowledge about the geometry and physiology of the eye, now want to see how we can use it in, in data-driven methods, OK? So as you can expect from data-driven flow, uh, you start by having some data. And in our case, it will be in images, of course. And then we feed this data into a pre-processing components, can be face detection, um, head pose estimation, et cetera. And you feed this data into your deep learning model. So you can have, uh, of course, a CNN. Um, and after training this model using uh, a huge data, you hope that you will uh, uh, be able to estimate the 2D or 3D uh, gaze point. Um, as we know from the eye uh, physiology and, and geometry, each person will, will have different intrinsic parameters. And these parameters, uh, uh, you cannot see them from the appearance. Okay? You can't see, see these parameters on the eye image. So what we can do uh, uh, to get this deep learning model fine-tuned for a specific person is to have uh, this person-specific calibration module can be implemented using uh, regression functions. Um, and then you can fine-tune your model for a specific uh, person. So the question here is what data we need and how we collect uh, this data. Um, so Basically, one way is to use uh, crowdsourcing uh, and to collect the real data. So we want, we ask the users to look at specific points on the screen. This is uh, the ground tooth label. Okay, this is the prediction that we want to predict, and we take an images of these users while uh, they are looking at this point. Um, so at the end, we'll collect a pairs of images and ground tooth labels. Um, so here's an example of such data where we collect uh, uh, images of, of a person. This is Gera, one of our uh, mechanical engineers. Uh, usually he's a happy and a friendly person. I'm not sure what, why he's sad here. Uh, and here we can see also the distribution of the points that he is looking at in the, in the screen or in the space. 
So if you do uh, data collection this way, um, you will have several uh, issues and challenges. Uh, basically, you will get an images with extreme lighting conditions because you are mainly uh, working outdoors or, or indoors. Um, you will have some reflections due to makeup or, or uh, people wearing eyeglasses. Um, you need also to deal with different camera resolution, which will affect the appearance of the eye. Sometimes the user is not uh, fixating at the point that you requested to, so the ground tool is not always valid, uh, valid as well. So it's very, ch okay, uh, it's very challenging uh, how you filter this huge data set you, you collected uh, to get the valid samples from, from it. Okay, it's a very challenging task. Uh, one other way to do uh, data collection will be to use a synthetic uh, data. So we can start by having a uh, synthetic uh, a model of an eye. Um, and we can generate similar images like the one we see here. Uh, you can take images from different viewpoints. You can simulate the pupil uh, size uh, effect on, uh, depending on the lighting conditions. And to get these images more realistic, because you see it's not realistic enough, we can apply a texture mapping techniques. So given a geometrical model, we can take different iris textures and map it uh, uh, to this eye model to get the variance in the appearance. Okay, so we, you want to be able to have this variance in the appearance of the eye uh, inside your training data set. So at the end, you should be able to collect a similar t data set like the one we see here. Um, so as, as you can see, you can have different iris textures, different uh, pupil sizes. Um, it looks very realistic, although it's all uh, synthetic here. And you can uh, train your networks using real data mixed with uh, synthetic data. You can have this um, mixing between the two uh, data collections. Um, so if we take a look at the market, so th there are several, several uh, devices available today for you to buy. They are mainly focusing on um, to work inside uh, labs on controlled environments. Uh, basically, they are using a special hardware uh, using an active IR sensors. Some of them are intrusive, requires heavy calibration, um, maybe also expensive. So that's why we uh, started Blink uh, about a year ago. And at Blink, uh, we are focusing on uh, several aspects. Of course, uh, the, main, the main one uh, is the algorithms, where we have our own uh, geometrical eye modeling. Uh, so we want to, to offer an end-to-end -end system, starting from the algorithms, uh, uh, to the data collection, sensors uh, optimization, and also in the inference side. So we, we guarantee that our algorithms will be able to run on any uh, devices with limited CPU and without the need of GPU uh, units. Um, and here's a just quick overview about Blink. Open your eyes. Okay. Blink. Are you ready to enter the world of AI? With Blink AI, what you see is what you get. It's a non-intrusive solution driven by AI that can be deployed on any RGB camera on any device. Try to imagine the world next year with Blink, a world you can control with just your eyes from the moment you wake up. Powered by technology that is easier and more intuitive to use, Blink enables secure eye-based identity verification and hands-free operation. It can also be used for access control in hygienic touchless elevators and more. Blink AI can easily recognize and adjust for various ethnic groups, age groups, lighting conditions, occlusions, and background settings. So it can be used for gaze-based authentication, heat map creation, augmented or virtual reality, digitalized stores and arenas, and more. 
Blink AI can be used to gain deep insights into what people see and what catches their attention. Draw conclusions about what drives specific actions or design innovative new user interfaces across various devices. Blink AI. See it. Believe it. Okay. Um, I think that, that's it for today. I will be here during the day uh, at the conference, so feel free to come and discuss more if you feel, uh, if you feel interested, of course. Yeah.